Well, good morning. So glad to have everyone back. And okay. And um, glad to have everyone back. And sorry about the delay in in our classes. It ended up being longer than was planned. But I'm getting back on track now. And we're going to continue our study uh, dealing with infant baptism. Um, as you recall, a few weeks ago we were studying on the Great Schism and how it produced the Eastern Orthodox Church, Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox, um, whatever you want to call it. And we started talking about the beliefs of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then we got into the some of their unusual beliefs and started looking at the Word of God and some of those things, things like their vanity of worship with the signs of the cross and how they had to do certain movements in a certain time and certain way, um, then kind of their unusual things they were doing with singing, um, while most of them actually use a cappella music, um, they, they don't adhere necessarily to congregational singing where the entire church sings together. And so we talked about perversions in singing. Um, Lord willing, next week we'll get into our last topic on the, what type of bread should we use in the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church teaches that we use leavened bread. And, and as opposed to unleavened bread. So we'll, we'll, Lord willing, start talking about that this week, next week, rather. And the topic we're on right now is infant baptism. Um, in our last class, we kind of went through a history of it and how it came to be and what was taught on the issue. And today we're going to be looking at what the Bible teaches. Uh, what does the Bible say? We see what man says. What's the Bible say? And we'll do a quick recap because it has been a little bit of a, of a time. Um, infant baptism is a moniker you see in a lot of the denominational world. Uh, why it arose, nobody really knows. There's not a clear-cut evidence as to why it arose. More than likely, it came from the false belief of original sin and this false belief that there was a need to baptize children to cleanse them from inherited sins. So, in actuality, there is no such thing as infant baptism. Um, we know that the word baptism means to dip or immerse. Generally speaking, any group that participates in infant baptism is not actually dipping or immersing the, the babies. They're sprinkling them or pouring water on them. The Eastern Orthodox Church being the notable uh, exception to that as they do practice immersion. In fact, they practice a threefold immersion. Um, the history reveals that it was accepted first by the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Ravenna in 1311. The, church, the Catholic Church used a fusion, that, that is the pouring on of water over the head, especially for infants, or, and it allowed immersion for those who are older. This practice is commonly practiced and continued today in the offshoots of Catholicism. So when we look at, at our chart here, you know, we see, you know, we start seeing false religion splitting away from the Lord's church, as we've talked about a bunch in our study, and to where you get the Roman Catholic Church, and then you have the Eastern Orthodox that splits off it, and you have all these other splinter groups that come off there. During the Reformation, you have the Lutheran, the Reformed, and the Church of England that starts. And then the Church of England has split off into the Episcopal and Methodist Methodism has split off of that. And you also have with the Reformed Church, um, the Presbyterian uh, denomination comes out of that, that theology. Calvinism um, is really big with that. And Calvinism, one of the tenets of it is original sin, the total hereditary depravity. So in these religions that believe in original sin, they will still practice infant baptism. So we went down and we looked at some of the history, and now we're getting into mankind's justification. And this first one we talked about in our last class, but we'll go through it really quickly. Uh, we're on page 8 of the outline now. Various men have sought to justify the act of infant baptism for a lot of different reasons. But like with many issues, let's look at the Word of God. What does it have to say? Um, one of the problems you have in, in the in religious world and just mankind in general is often we approach an issue with biases towards whatever the topic is. We already have a, a preconceived notion of what we believe, and so 
we will go through the Bible and find evidence to support what we believe instead of just letting the Word of God speak for itself and then determining our beliefs based off of what the Word of God says. And because of that, we get a lot of what we see in the denominational world that we have a lot of false doctrine taught because individuals approach the Word of God with their belief in whatever topic and then manipulate the Word of God to mean what to support what they believe. Uh, millennialism is a very good example of that. Um, a lot of that is, is taught based off of passages in Revelation. If you just read God's Word and let it speak for itself, then you're not going to come away with the understanding of the millennialistic theology. But those who already have that preconceived idea and I'm thinking that there's going to be an earthly kingdom set up in a large battle of Armageddon and so forth, and then Israel's going to be um, put back in place and Jerusalem's going to be a place of prominence. When they read Revelation, they pick out verses that sound like they're talking about what they believe. In actuality, it's not correct. So let's look at one apologist, and we'll go through this quickly. We already talked about this last time. They base their their writings, of, uh, their case off the writings of Origen. Uh, C.W. Miller makes the defense of infant baptism because of Origen's statement on the tradition of the church regarding infant baptism. He asserts that its usage was a custom of the church to baptize infants, and if this was not a fact, every contemporary with Origen could have contradicted it, and there would just and there would just be the same opportunity for the contradictions to survive as there was for his statement. Uh, the fact is that he says that uncontradicted that about 120 years after the apostles, it was the usage of the church to baptize infants. So we talked about this statement and this, um, this, this defense of infant baptism, and there were some issues with it. You know, the first question was, was there no opposition to infant baptism during Orion's time? Well, Word of God clearly contradicts it. Believer's baptism, adult uh, believer's baptism, I guess you don't have to be an adult, but above, beyond the age of accountability. So, Scripture opposes it. Uh, we also know that the writings are totally and opposed infant baptism on the basis children should wait. And does the lack of writings existing today mean that no one opposed it, as Miller claimed? Well, of course not. We have just a limited amount of the writings from that time that exists today. And actual, in actuality, though, there were writings, contemporary writings that exist today that predate Orion, you now the inspired writings like the New Testament for one, and we also have second century writings that dispute this. Tertullian disputed this idea of it. Simply because it had become a custom of the church by 120 years after the apostles, after the inspired writing, the inspiration of scripture had ceased, does, does it make it right? Well, you know, no, it doesn't. You know, during the time when we had the inspired writers, um, they were speaking the utterance of God through the Holy Spirit. Nearly every congregation had problems. Whenever It doesn't take long of reading the New Testament, especially the Pauline epistles, to see there are problems in every church. And that's the same today. There is not a congregation out there where there is not some type of problem. There's just some congregations that are better dealing with the problems and addressing things off the Word of God than others. Um, but we go to the example of 1 Corinthians 5, where everyone was in agreement to tolerate the sinful relationship between this uh, man and his mother. And did that make it right, though? Well, of course not. And that's what Paul is teaching on. You cannot tolerate this sin. This is bad you have to turn them over to Satan so their soul might be saved. Simply because a practice is unopposed and cheered on doesn't make it right. You know, we go to the example in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 with the, with the 12 spies returning from Canaan. You had Joshua and Caleb said, God's given it to us, let's go today. You had the 10 unfaithful spies that were opposed, opposed to going in and and they convinced the rest of Israel to not go in. So you had four men, because Aaron and Moses were not wanting to delay, they wanted to go too. So four men out of 603,550 were 
were, were, were said to go. So that's a very small percentage. So statistically speaking, those who wanted to return to Egypt were unopposed. That didn't make it right. And they were all punished for that, for that problem, for their lack of faith. So we talked about that one last time. So now we'll get into some new material this morning. Um, so we looked at this one apologist and how they t attempted to justify the false doctrine of infant baptism. And we're going to look at a couple other ones, um, a couple other justifications people will use the Bible. Uh, the first one we want to look at is households were baptized. So whenever we read this, the assumption is when we're reading Scripture and Acts 16 is a good example of a couple, a couple of these, where a household says the household was baptized, and the assumption is made this included infant children. The problem is we cannot assume that a household includes young infant children. After all, let's look at this congregation. There are households in this congregation where the couple, for one reason or another, they don't have children. They never had children. Um, there are also households in this congregation where you have only children of a countable age. Um, pick on Billy Hayes, for example. In his household, he has two daughters. They're, one is in college and one is in high school. They're both of a countable age. No infants in that. So just because you read that a household, there's a household of Lydia, a household of the Philippian jailer, we cannot automatically assume that that means infant children. Maybe there were, maybe there weren't, but we can't assume that. Scripture doesn't say. Additionally, the claim that there were children of any age is a pure assumption for the word household may mean servants or employees, as in the case of the Caesar's household in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, where it can only mean imperial employees, according to McLaughlin. So, the same word used for household, for Caesar's household in Philippians chapter, um, chapter 4, is the same word used in, in Acts 16, 34, with the house, of the, Philippian, the house of the Philippian jailer. It's used for the house of Stephanus in 2 Corinthians 16. So in those cases, it's the same word, the same justification people use to say it's infants, is the same word we know in Philippians 4 absolutely would not have been infants. So let's look at Acts chapter 16. And we'll look at a couple of these. So beginning in chapter 16, um, we'll talk about Lydia. Advocates of infant baptism will cite Lydia's household as a clear example of infant baptism. Beginning in verse 13, And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a river where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted thither. The women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, seller of, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she sought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. In the case of Lydia's household, it's assumed that it included children. However, let's consider a couple things. Those who were part of the household were old enough to be called brethren. When we skip down to, chapter, to verse 40 of the same chapter, after Paul and Silas had been released from prison after the conversion of the Philippian jailer and his household, and they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had, been, when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Can infants be considered brethren? Why would we consider infants brethren? You know, they, they sometimes, but usually don't, sit and participate in anything. Usually they're coloring or looking at the, looking around or whatever, you know, but they aren't really, they aren't brethren. 
Lydia was a merchant woman, far from her Asiatic home in Thyatira, engaged in business, a consideration which makes it intrinsically improbable that she had infant children. Almost certainly, household here means employees, according to McLaughlin. Whenever we go to the Philippian jailer, we scoot down just a few verses in chapter 16. Advocates will then point to the Philippian jailer's household as another clear example of infant baptism. Beginning in verse 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, all his straightway. And when they had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. In this passage, it states that all that were baptized were believers. Therefore, if all who were baptized were believers, this removes the possibility that infants were baptized too. If we go back in our outline to our last lesson, we're going through what the different denominations teach on this. And we look, you know, we go down to about page three of the outline, and you start looking specifically with the Catholic Church and the Church of England, the Episcopal Church. Um, it talks about that the ones who have to give their confession and have the faith in the baptism are the adults. They're not the one actually being spring, having water poured on them or sprinkled. So if they were all believers, even by the same way that the denominational world teaches the process of their infant baptism, then they have to concede this cannot include infants because the infants are not the ones who, make the, who the, have the belief. It's the adults, the godparents, who have the belief in it. When we look at the church of Corinth in chapter 18 of Acts, we see another one. Advocates will point to this as another example of infant baptism. In chapter 18, verse 8 of Acts, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. Again, same word as, first, uh, as Philippians 4.22 in the household of Caesar. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. I'm sorry, that was in verse 7. That was the same word, not verse 8. My mistake. Um, again, this is another example that advocates will point to where it says that, well, this is clearly an example of, of children being baptized. However, in, the case, in this case, all those that were believed of the Corinthians, they first heard the word, and then they were baptized. Hence, no infant baptism, because, again, belief. This is, again, an example of believer's baptism. 1 Corinthians 1.16, the household of Stephanus, mentioned him just a minute ago. There's another, another one they cite as an example of it. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 16, And I baptize also the household of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptize any other. However, whenever we take the whole counsel of God and we don't pick isolated scriptures to support what we believe, we see something else. We turn to chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, and Paul says something else. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it was the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Those old, of the household of Stephanus were old enough to serve the Lord. Can an infant addict themselves to the ministry of the saints? Whenever we think of... Well, what what would be considered an infant? Is that under three years old, under two years old, something like that? Depending on their mood, a two-year-old can do service for you. Like, Noel, can you go take this to Michael? Depending on her mood, she might do it. Most likely she wouldn't do it. But whenever we think of infant baptism, it's usually babies. Babies can't really do anything 
You know, they're just, you have to serve them completely. You know, you have to, you have to take care of them. You have to make sure they're fed, make sure they have clean diapers, make sure that they have their clothes and stuff. They can't do that for other people. An infant cannot addict themselves to the ministry of the saints. In addition, these households were also said to believe. Would that include children? If anything, it would indicate that children were not included. Also, look at a couple other examples of Scripture. When Joshua stated that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, did he mean he and his infants would serve the Lord? No, that's not what was meant in this passage. It meant he was setting a standard that in his house, we're going to teach everyone to serve after the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to set the standard, and I'm going to teach everyone to grow up to serve the Lord. And also consider this, that Joshua was very old at this time. He was, he, we don't know his exact age. We know he died at 110 years old. This was not long before his death, 10, 15 years. So he probably would not have had infant children. He might have had infant grandchildren or great-grandchildren. But... Um, but he was just setting the standard. We're going to follow after the Lord. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure I'm raising my children and my children's children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm the standard bearer here. This is what we're going to do. When God told Noah to prepare an ark for the saving of all his house, if we use the same logic that was used in the case of Lydia and the Philippian jailer, we have to assume this included infants. We can't do that. You know, Hebrews 11 says it, then we have to say this has to be infants because the household includes infants. But what does Scripture teach us? Well, one, we know that all of Noah's sons were old enough to be married. Um, we also know from the Old Testament and the New Testament there were only eight people on the ark. So Noah and his wife and Ham, Sham, and Japheth and their wife. We also know that the three boys were all about 100 years old and that they did not have children yet. They did not have children until two years after the flood. Um, I think Shem, maybe, two years after the flood when his first son, first son was born. Um, so we know that. So we cannot just make this, use this logic of automatically assuming a household must include infants because we have a specific example here where it absolutely did not include infants. From looking at Scripture, we can see these arguments that are man-made. They do not hold up, and that's the problem with man-made arguments. When you put them up against the Word of God, the Word of God's always going to win. Uh, they don't hold up to the truth of God's Word. Another, another way people look at this is they try to parallel baptism and circumcision. If we look at Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, "...in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism." Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and, your, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So passages like this are where circumcision and baptism are talked about together. People take that and say, Baptism replaced circumcision. Um, the arguments then made that since children were circumcised, so children can also be baptized. This, this could be maybe one of the earliest arguments made in favor of or made to justify infant baptism. While, while you could say they are parallels from one another, um, um, I don't know if you could say one, it's a type anti-type situation. I don't know that you could go that far. But they have similarities. But they are not the same. First of all, only men were circumcised. But we see in the New Testament, men and women are baptized. 
We see that baptism puts off sin, which means sins must first exist. This means that a child must be old enough to be accountable to the law. Again, people that have this tact, that uh, have this belief, assume children are born with sin, which we know is not true from the Word of God. We also see that faith is required before baptism. This means that a person must be old enough to have faith. A baby does not have faith. We have no New Testament writer that ever makes such an argument. One is not in place of the other. After all, when we look at the Word of God, we know that both Christ and the apostles were circumcised and baptized. So, in consideration, specifically, we have examples of Paul, circumcised on the eighth day, and then he was baptized. We actually have that example in Scripture. We know that Christ was circumcised, and then Christ was also baptized by John. So, if circumcision was the same as baptism, then they wouldn't need both. They would only need one. In consideration of the issue and the false arguments that are made regarding this practice, um, under the Old Testament, giving justification for baptism for babies, circumcision in the Old Testament, let's consider a few things. Again, circumcision, this was only for the Jews. Um, it could be for servants bought with money and so forth. However, it was restricted to the Jews, whereas baptism is for all nations. That's our specific command to go into all the world. Again, uh, circumcision was for males only, whereas baptism for women and men. If circumcision was the justification for infant baptism, then only boys could be baptized as babies, not girls. Circumcision was performed on the eighth day. However, baptism is for those of any age who are able to hear, believe, repent, confess, and desire to be baptized. If circumcision was the justification for an infant baptism, then it would have to be on the eighth day, just like, just like circumcision. Um, and we know that's not the case, that not all, not all babies are baptized on the eighth day whenever they do their ceremony. The circumcision of the Old Testament was done by human hands, yet we know that the spiritual circumcision of the New Testament, i.e. baptism, is done without hands. Circumcision requires no faith on the boy being circumcised. However, biblical baptism is seen, as we see in the New Testament, does require faith. And while the Old Testament circumcision pertained wholly to the flesh, baptism is the answer of a good conscience towards God. We could go through a lot more examples, but from the quick one we looked at, we can see that baptism and circumcision are not the same. The requirement of circumcision in the Old Testament does not justify the practice of baptizing babies. When we look at the Word of God, what does it say? Well, first of all, it says baptize, baptizing babies is not taught there. It ain't going to be found. Original sin is not found in the Bible. Beyond the fact that the first sin commit, it was the first sin committed, Adam's sin is not different than any other sins as far as it was a direct, it was a direct disobedience to a godly command. Whenever, the only reason it's really different is because of the consequences that we still face today because of this sin. Uh, let's, we go to Leviticus chapter 10 with Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, who offered the strange fire before the Lord, and they were consumed by fire. Um, their sin was no different in the fact that it was a direct disobedience to a command of God. God said, do not eat the fruit. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. God said, Offer this type of fire, we're going to offer strange fire. Now, the consequences were different, but the sin was really no difference. God said to do, it one, do one thing, they did another thing, just like Adam. What appears to have happened, though, is that people see the universal nature of sin. Um, 
Verses like Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And based upon scriptures as this, they make the false conclusion that sin must be inherited. But we know from scripture, children don't inherit the sins of their parents. This being the case, we understand that no one could have inherited Adam's sin. We know that infants are not subject to biblical baptism because in the Word of God, we're taught for someone to be saved, they must be taught with understanding being implied by belief. Then, you know, they must believe, must believe. They must repent, and they must be able to confess before they're baptized. An infant is not subject to biblical baptism because they cannot understand what is taught in the Word of God. They cannot believe on the Word of God once they've been taught. They cannot repent of sins once they've been confronted with the Word of God and they cannot confess their faith in God or Christ. We know that infants are not sinners. Denominationalism will teach that an infant is original sin on their soul when they're born. Um, we'll spend an entire class on this later, specifically when we get to Calvinism and that point in our study. But So we'll just touch this briefly. Um, original sin is a man-made doctrine. It is found nowhere in the Word of God. Christ's teaching regarding children was when the you know, we go to Mark four, or ten fourteen, when the disciples rebuked those who were bringing their children to Jesus. What did Jesus said? Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. When teaching his disciples who would be in the greatest in the kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter eighteen, Christ said, "Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven." If children are born with sin, and we got to be chill, like children, we got to be like people with sin, how can we go into heaven? Sin can't enter heaven. In order to become a sinner, a person has to commit a sin. There is a period in someone's life as a child when they don't know the difference between good and evil. Isaiah talks about this in part of another prophecy. He mentions this, For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, Isaiah makes this point. There is a time in a child's life when they don't know how to choose the difference between good and evil. Moses also states that we're not going to suffer punishment for another sin. Deuteronomy chapter 24, 16, Fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Ezekiel states something very similar, that you will not suffer punishment because of someone else's sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Um, these passages, they don't teach that, you know, certainly there are consequences for sin, and innocent people suffer because of other people's sin. Uh, we have a good example of this with David and Bathsheba and Uriah and the child that was born out of that adulterous relationship. Um, there were innocent people that suffered because of someone else's sin. That's not the case that's taught here. That's a different, that's a different topic. This is talking about that you will not be condemned because I will not be condemned because Michael sinned. I will not, the things that my father did will not be a reason to condemn me. Um, I, don't, I don't have to repent because of my father's sins and vice versa. We cannot find any example in the Word of God where infant baptism is practiced. You know, God shows us in His inspired Word that individuals heard the gospel message, they believed, and then were baptized. We don't there's nothing that even remotely comes close to being a biblical record of the inspired Word of God where any type of effusion or sprinkling was ever practiced as far as baptism goes. Um, I don't ever have a record of any type of infant child or baby, anyone below the age of accountability, that was ever baptized. So what about unbaptized babies then? Those who believe this topic in this, uh, this doctrine, what, what do we do with that? Because sometimes, sadly, babies die before they 
have a chance to have water sprinkled on them. So what, what, what happens to those babies? If they're born with sin and that sin can't be washed away, what do you do with it? If babies are born with sin and die before they're baptized, do they go to hell? Do they go to limbo if they're not baptized? If they do not go to hell or limbo for lack of baptism, then the doctrine of teaching original sin is incorrect. Keep that in mind. This was written in the 1997 Catechism of the Catholic Church. Born with a fallen human nature and tainted by original sin, children also have, the need, have need of the new birth of baptism to be freed from the power of darkness and brought into the realm of the freedom of the children of God. In, in an article, The Hope of Salvation for Infants Who Die Without Baptism, being Baptized, original sin implies a state of separation from Christ, and that excludes the possibility of the vision of God for those who die in that state. So if they do not go to be with Christ, who is at the right hand of God, why did Jesus teach we need to be like them? If they do not go to be, when they die, they do not go to the right hand of Christ in heaven, where's the only other option for them to go? According to the Bible, be hell. If that's their destination, why would Christ teach us to be like them? All man-made doctrines, we see a lot of inconsistency as well as very illogical logic. As we've seen previously in the study, the idea of infant baptism or original sin is taught nowhere in the Word of God. It was not until after all the apostles and inspired writers passed from this life that we start seeing documentation appear discussing the issue, and we spent that in the early part of the outline. We spent the time talking about that. It wasn't until after the death, many years after this, that this issue arises as well as the consequences for those who were not baptized. Same article, the idea of limbo, which the church has used for many centuries to designate the destiny of infants who die without baptism, has no clear foundation in Revelation, talking about the Word of God, even though it has long been used as traditional theological teaching. So we can't tell people babies are going to go to hell, so we're going to make up this new place, this limbo where they go to, and as this article teaches, states, it was just made up. It was no, there's nothing in the Bible we got this from, but we've been teaching it as fact for centuries. Encountering the view of Pelagius, who rejected the doctrine of original sin, Augustine was led to state that infants who die without baptism are consigned to hell. So we go back to 4th, 5th century, the teaching was, you don't baptize your baby and they die, they're going to hell. You, scoot, you move forward about 10 centuries. In the 12th, 13th century, the expression limbo of infants was forged to, to name the resting place of such infants. This was the border of the inferior region. So they aren't quite in heaven, but they don't go to hell. They're not. They're in this limbo. Um, I don't believe this is the same thing as purgatory. I believe this is different. But I'm not 100%. I'll see. When we get to the purgatory stuff, I'll see if I can clear that up. We had this debate that raged through the centuries with the dogma of the Catholic Church stating that it was required, and without it, no one could enter the kingdom of heaven. Hence, according to Gibbons, who is a Catholic apologist, um, Baptism washes away original sin. It's essential for the infant as the full-grown man in order to attain the kingdom of heaven. Same, same book, next page. Though the church, in obedience to God's word, declares that unbaptized infants are excluded from the kingdom of heaven, it should not hence be concluded they are, that should be are, assigned, consigned to the place of the reprobate. Again, coming to this limbo area. We don't know what to do with it because we're making this up as we go along. So we have all this teaching. It's kind of all over the place. First they're going to hell, then they're going to limbo, then we don't know where they're going. In 2007, 16 years ago, 
the Roman Catholic Church completely reversed course and suddenly said, they're not going to suffer away from God. Our conclusion is that the many factors that we have considered above give serious theological and liturgical grounds for the hope that unbaptized infants who die will be saved and enjoy the beatific vision. So suddenly, after centuries of you're going to hell, no, they're going to limbo, now they're going to go with God. Again, man-made doctrines are, it's the house built on the sand. They won't stand because they aren't the solid word of God. That's why they're constantly changing. From Scripture we know God has given us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness. This being the case, it's odd that we find no direction given for infant baptism if we're claiming that it's required. This being the case, infant baptism then cannot pertain unto life or godliness. Acts chapter 20, Paul spoke the whole counsel of God, yet nowhere does he mention infant baptism. And this being the case, we have to conclude that infant baptism is not a part of the whole counsel of God. Paul stated that the Word of God thoroughly furnishes us unto all good works, yet it gives no clear direction on baptizing infants or babies. This being the case, we have to conclude it's not a part of all good works. We know that infant baptism has nothing to do with faith, has nothing to do with repentance, confession, or obedience, since we find it nowhere in Scripture where God authorized it. It's therefore a vain practice and is rooted in the traditions of men. You know, the, our, our last class, the first half of this outline, talks about where those traditions came from. And no one knows, but they kept being built upon. Someone just randomly said, we need to do this, long after the silence of scriptures, and we had the Word of God completed. Then they decided, well, we need to do this now. And it's just become a tradition that that's what you do. Infant baptism was never mentioned. It's never even hinted of in Scripture. However, believers' baptism is discussed extensively. We know that infants are safe. They are not sinners. They have not need for baptism for their salvation because they are not in a lost state. However, all persons of accountable age must believe and obey the gospel command in order to be freed from the bondages of sin. If the need for infant baptism was for it's critical to salvation for them, it's really strange that we never find a single solitary scripture that either commands it, implies it, or that gives an example of it taking place. We'll end this on a quote from Moises Pinedo, I think that's how he pronounced his name, um, made an inter interesting observation. Babies and little children do not have sickly souls, nor do they need baptism for spiritual healing. No one would give penicillin to a baby who is not sick and does not need it. No one would take his newborn son to the hospital so that he could undergo surgery to remove a non-existent tumor. Similarly, no one should subject a baby to baptism that is designed to forgive sins which the baby cannot commit. So it's a very interesting observation pointing out some of the fallacies that with the infant baptism. Just like any other thing, the Bible is very logical. And when you get a false doctrine and you start applying clear logic to it, then it starts to fall apart because, yeah, you wouldn't do this for a baby because they don't need it. Why would you do this? They don't need it. And it comes, again, from the false belief that their babies are born with sin, which is against what Scripture teaches. And Lord willing, when we get to that lesson in dealing with Calvinism, we'll spend a lot more time dealing with that specific issue and why it does not hold up the truth of God's Word. Questions, comments? All right. Lord willing, we'll get into our the, the last of the four topics dealing with the beliefs of the Eastern Orthodox Church next week. The, what type of bread should we be using for the Lord's Supper? So thank you very much.